Are you ready for a clean slate? That's what I'm talking about today. We have baptism today. So biblically, I wanted to break it down because in my heart, I believe that before you can take a step of faith like baptism, you need to understand what you're getting into. I don't want you to just sign your name and just, you know, give me the title deed to everything. I want you to understand what you're getting into. God never makes you go into anything blindly. Now, we do walk by faith and not by sight. So, in a sense, you're doing things blindly. But I believe it's biblical to have a good teaching on this. So, the message today is, are you ready for a clean slate? And, and I just want to share a story about whenever I got baptized. Um, I was one of those people I got saved and then it was like, okay, well, I want to be baptized now. Because, like, I, I always felt like unless I'm baptized, I'm not, like, fully Christian. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like that was the ritual to let me into the club, which isn't really the case. Uh, when, whenever you get baptized, it, it's an outward sign of your faith. It's a public declaration that, hey, I'm in the Jesus club now. And, and I'm going to I'm gonna show you that by getting dunked underwater in front of everybody. And I'm going to stand up. I'm going to be a new creation. So my thing was, I had so many sins in my life. I was like, I need to get rid of some of these sins. You know, I mean, I was walking up to God in, like, filthy rags. I had stains, you know, I had sloppy Joe dripping down my chest of sin. Come on, somebody. I bet you never heard of a sloppy Joe sin. I had the sloppy Joe sins. And if you ever seen Billy Madison, the lunch lady made him extra sloppy for me. Because I was dirty in sin. And my thing was, you mean to tell me that I can come to Jesus, and I can be baptized, and I can have a whole new slate. I can have no sin. So I stood up out of the water and I was like, wow, this is what righteousness feels like. This is what a new beginning feels like. And it was like the most incredible feeling in the world. You know, so much so that every time we do baptism, I want to get baptized again because I need that clean slate with God. Because how many know, even if you're serving Jesus and you're walking with him, sometimes when we sin and we do things that are wrong, it weighs on our conscience. You know, and the devil will speak to you, I can't believe you're a servant of God. Look at the way you act. And the devil will always convict you of that. Let me tell you, in Jesus, there's no condemnation. So that was my story about when I was baptized and what the meaning was behind it for me. Uh, just the idea that publicly I'm taking a new start. This is a new Anthony from this day forward. And I always tell people this this little joke. I mean, it's it's a joke, but it's also true. Like, I was, I was leaving church that day. And I was so excited I had no more sins. They were wiped away. I had a fresh slate. And as we're driving out of the parking lot, somebody cuts me off right on Perrysville Avenue. And I'm like, you son of a... And then, like, I realized that I swore. And I was like, that's a buy one, get one free sin. Come on, somebody. I'm like, oh, bleep, I just swore. So there, there goes my clean slate. But that's just, that's just like an amusing little story I like to tell people. Don't be like me. Be like Jesus. Come on. <laughs> so why is it important for me to be baptized? Here's a few examples. The first reason is whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. I don't think I really have to break that down. Being saved is what you want to be. You know what I mean? So that doesn't really need broken down. Second reason. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and John baptized him in the Jordan River. So if you're in church, if you're following Jesus, that means you're a Christian. That means little Christ. It means you're meant to be like Jesus. So the second reason is Jesus was baptized. We are to follow in his legacy. We are to follow in his footsteps. So Jesus was baptized. So that's the second reason that you should strive to be baptized. The third reason is this is the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the third reason is he told us to do this. This is one of his commands to us, to not only go out and make disciples, but to then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is basically um, said, you should do this because, you know, this, this is what you do with your first step. I did this, and now he's commanding you to do this. So let me give you a few biblical examples of baptism. The first example is in Acts 3, 38 to 36 to 38. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there is some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. So let me give you a little backstory on this. Philip's walking down the road. 
And out of nowhere, he sees this carriage coming by with this Ethiopian eunuch in it. And this guy's actually sitting there reading through the book of Isaiah. And he's trying to figure out what it says. So that Philip overhears this, and if, if you're a pastor, you're a man of God, you hear somebody talking about Jesus, that's an easy end. Come on. If you hear somebody talking about Jesus, because sometimes it's hard to share your faith even as a pastor. But if you hear somebody talking about their faith, you, you just want to stick up and say, yeah, so what you know about Jesus? Come on. <laughs> so Philip's walking down the road, and he's like, come on, God, you put that on a silver platter for me. So he's like, dude, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch's like, no, not really. Like, do you understand what I'm reading? Come on, he probably had that King James somebody. <laughs> I'm a pastor. If I'm sitting there with King James, I'm going to believe, thou shalt, Lord, you need to help me. Come on, somebody. So, so Philip starts to explain to him, like, look, you're reading about Jesus. This is what Jesus did. You know, I was one of his disciples. And when Jesus walked the earth, I was with him, and I saw him do all these cool things. So Philip started to tell him about Jesus, started to witness Jesus. And then I know where this, this eunuch is like, well, you know what? I want to put my faith in Jesus. And as they're riding down the road, they're like, dude, there's water right there. Baptize me. That's the type of faith God wants you to have. Well, there's water. Why can't I be baptized? The second uh, example would be in Acts 16, verses 30 to 33. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with, the, excuse me, with him and all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, and wash their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. I want you to hold on to that immediately. So here's what happened. Paul and Silas, they were in prison. And out of nowhere, there was this quaking. And they were released, right? And the jailer was like, holy heck, what happened? Like, this is a sign of God. So then um, they're out. And this guy could be killed for letting these criminals escape. And, and just by seeing the power of God manifested, he's like, what must I do to be saved? Because this God that you serve must be who you says he is. So basically, he's like, here's what you need to do. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Pretty simple. You believe in Jesus with your heart. You confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you're saved. That's what the Bible says. But I love how Paul says, along with everyone in your household... Because how many know when you come to know Jesus, it's not just for you, but it's for everyone around you. When you come to know Jesus, that's contagious. Come on, somebody. When you come to know Jesus, it's like getting the flu and you're a kid in school. Everybody's going to get it. Their families are going to get it. So when you come to know Jesus, it's a contagious bug. It's not just for you, but it's for everybody in your household. You know what I mean? I came to know Jesus. My wife didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. I didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. But then I came to know him, and I was like, I need more Jesus in my life. So then I went home, and, and I started to infect her with Jesus. She, that Jesus started to creep up in her. And then all of a sudden, she needed some more of that Jesus. And then she started going to people, and they needed some more Jesus. And that's how Jesus works. He just infects one person to another. And I know an affection doesn't sound very good, but if there's an affection for Christ, sign me up today. Come on, somebody. I don't need no immunity to that. That's what the devil's handing out. We don't need an immunity to Christ. We need more of him. Come on. I don't know if it's possible, but if you can overdose on Christ, come on. Shoot me up with that. Give me some of that Holy Spirit and fire today. Come on. Then even at that hour of the night after he washed their wounds and everything, him and everybody in his household were immediately baptized. He wasn't like, dude, let me sleep on this, think about it a while. They were immediately baptized. He's like, Paul, get your raggedy butt up. I know you've been in jail, so you've been lounging around for a while. Get up. Don't be lazy. Take me to this river and dunk me. Because if I'm a follower of Jesus, I want to walk out the things of God. So immediately they were baptized. Acts 2.41, this is my final example. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. Look at this picture. 3,000 people coming to know Jesus that day and baptized. Let me give you a little backstory. This is right after the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. 
and, and it was poured out upon the, uh, the early disciples, and out of nowhere they started speaking in other tongues, like, and, and they were praising God and saying things that all these different people heard in their own language. Because this was um, right after the Passover, so there was a ton of people in Jerusalem at the time, so they all heard these uh, apostles praising God in their native tongues. And they realized these are Galileans. These guys aren't the smartest people. They're not the sharpest knives in the drawer. Come on. And then they heard them speak in these languages they couldn't know. And then out of nowhere, Peter, who, who had run away, denied Christ, he was like a scaredy cat just, just a little bit before this, stands up boldly and starts proclaiming the gospel. And when he did this, this guy who had failed, this guy who, who denied Christ to his face, he stood up and the power of the Holy Spirit came on him. And he just proclaimed the truths of God. And 3,000 people came to know Jesus. Come on. Can you imagine that? This is somebody who had failed God. Now he's standing up proclaiming the goodness of God and 3,000 people would respond. And immediately him and the other disciples just dunk in one after another. 3,000 people in the Lake Jordan. That's just incredible. So this is what I want you to also take out of this. Even though you might have screwed up, God is not done with you yet. He has a plan for your life. You might have, you might have done wrong. You might have walked away for a season. But guess what? He used Peter, and Peter was a moron. I don't mean that in a bad way, but I, I relate to Peter. I'm that guy who fails Jesus time and time again, and he still does incredible things in my life. He's going to do that for you, too. So I want you to take heart today. I want you to realize that it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. When you have that righteousness of Christ in you. He doesn't see that sloppy Joe mix all over your shirt. But he sees the righteousness of Jesus, and he can do incredible things through his son. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that means the Holy Spirit resides in you, and you can tap into the power of God. Just like Peter did. Peter stood up there, man. I don't even know. Peter knew what he was saying. He even convicted them that this Jesus whom you crucified. He straight up said, you killed him. And they still came to know Jesus. He came up and he was just boldly proclaiming it. So let's just break down the meaning of baptism real quick. And I'm going to kind of fly through this a little bit because I really want to get over there. And I really want to baptize you guys today. So Romans chapter 6, 3 to 9. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death has no longer any power over him. That's some good plot of scripture right there. I just want to plow that land all day. That's filled with promises for you. So here's a little diagram of what baptism is. Now, I didn't draw this. If I did, it would have looked a lot better. Come on. You know, humbleness is one of those qualities Jesus looks for. I need to tap into that. So anyway, here, here's basically the way it is. You're recognizing first his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So you're being crucified with, with Christ. And then when you go under the water, basically you're... you're, you're proclaiming Christ. You're, you're putting death your old self. You're saying these sins, this lifestyle, this is over with. Once you get dunked under the water and you're there, that's you're, you're representing, you're being buried with Christ. So that old life is now dead. It's buried. And then whenever you um, come up out of the water, you're risen with him to new life. So that represents a completely new person. So this is what I want you to get. This is why baptism is, is so important. This is why this is one of my favorite steps of faith. Because it, it, it is a representation of what Jesus did. So what does the word baptism mean? It comes from the Greek word bapto, 
which means to immerse. Um, most forms of bathtub simply convey washing, but it's clear that its primary meaning is immersion. So it means washing. It means washing by immersion. So you're basically taking all those sins, that sloppy Joe mix, and you're wiping it clean. When you come up, you're a completely new person. You have no more sins because Jesus is there to wipe you clean. So this is what baptism literally means. It means to wash you by immersion. Second point is, what is the purpose of water baptism? Now, there's five points. The first one is, it's a biblical way of confessing saving faith. I've, I've scripture referenced all of these, so if you guys want to do a Bible study on this later and just make sure that I'm not, you know, speaking out the rear end here, um, feel free. But it is a biblical way of confessing saving faith. It's a physical symbol of our spiritual salvation, the physical demonstration of being identified with Christ, a public reflection of our membership into Christ's church, and a public statement of our commitment to the Lordship of Jesus. Think about that. It, it's a public commitment. It's like when you get married, you have to have at least one witness there, so that way you can be like, look, this is a public commitment. This is like showing, hey, I'm committed to Jesus. This is what the wrong call for. When should someone be baptized? Immediately, as shown in the book of Acts. Don't wait. If you haven't been baptized, or maybe you have, and you know, it really didn't have a meaning for you. God's going to reveal that to you today. The Holy Spirit's going to convict you. And, and really, you need to act on this immediately. God's not a God of just hang out there for a while and maybe one day you'll muster up the courage. God's a God of action. When God says go, you go. So you need to be baptized immediately. And the last thing is, what should I do before being baptized? So a person should demonstrate a clear understanding of the gospel message Guess what? If you've been hearing me jabber my gums all this time, you probably understand the gospel. Um, and then also a committed faith to Jesus Christ. So basically, if you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus, if, you use it, if you've accepted him into your heart, which everyone here has, then you're ready to be baptized. So then I will just close it and say, are you ready to be baptized? Because it's time to wipe the slate clean. Are you ready for this in your life? You know, and really what I want to do is I just want to give you a minute just to ponder this. Like, do I need to be baptized? And if you do, then what we're going to do is we're going to transition service right now. We're going to go over to Eric and Regina's house. They live right across the street. They have a pool set up in the backyard. Come on, they saved me some hassle this year. Last year I had to build one in the front of the church. But this year we can just walk across the street. And uh, we can really take this step of faith together. And I'm just really excited to be able to share this moment with you guys.